This is the Sheila Hudson Grace Memorial Lectureship. And it is um, endowed by Ellie Tumbridge, who was a board member of the Berman Institute. Uh, has had a long and distinguished uh, career of service at Johns Hopkins. She actually received the university's Heritage Award in 2003. And she endowed this um, lectureship, uh, biannual lectureship, um, to focus on the issue of palliative care in the intersection with bioethics. And it was instigated um, uh, at the death of her daughter, who was Sheila Hudson Reeves, who died in 1988 of breast cancer. So it has a very special significance here in our community and in the field of bioethics. And we are very privileged uh, to be able to invite some of our incredible colleagues to uh, um, and speak to us about issues that are in, in many ways related to that central question of life and death and how we all sort of blend together in the area of bioethics. So our speaker today is Bob Trude. Many of you, I'm sure, have um, had the opportunity of reading his incredible contributions to the field of bioethics. He is the Francis Glesser Lee Professor of Medical Ethics Anesthesia and Pediatrics, and Director of the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. Bob and I met a really long time ago at uh, the Kennedy Institute um, intensive course, and I often say that Bob and I have grown up together in bioethics. Both of us with a background in pediatrics, and we have had an incredible opportunity to work on many, many projects together. Um, in various aspects of bioethics. Um, Bob is the um, director of the Center for Bioethics, um, a new program at Harvard Medical School, along with Christine Mitchell, um, where they're launching a graduate program in bioethics and fellowship program. Bob is also still a, a practicing pediatric intensivist in the pediatric ICU at um, Boston Children's Hospital. And he has um, served there for almost 30 years. He also is the director for the uh, Center for Professionalism and Ethical Practice uh, at uh, Children's Hospital. And uh, another area that Bob and I have to work with each other on was the issue of pediatric palliative care. He's published over 250 articles and has made incredible contributions to the field, has served um, many co-workers and um, has really contributed both from a clinical practice policy and research perspective. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Bob and I invite you to join me in welcoming him today. As you said, that was really nice. We really kind of have grown up together in the field. I mean, uh, uh, that time at Georgetown, I think, for both of us, was really at the beginning of our interest in bioethics. And um, so you've been a great partner all these years uh, in, in um, our shared interests. Um, and I uh, also would like to, to thank Ruth and the German Institute for having me. It's my, my first time here, and it's uh, just really wonderful. It's a um, great opportunity to, to see firsthand all the good work that's going on here. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, microethics. It's a um, idea that uh, I've been thinking about now for several years, it's not fully developed. So there's going to be parts of this where you might say, well, I'm not really you know, sure what he means here or there, and uh, it's not because you're not getting it, it's because I'm still trying to develop these ideas. And so I hope in our discussion we'll be able to, uh, to explore them a little bit more. Um, most of, much of what I'm going to talk about uh, has to do with work I do with a group at Children's Hospital in Boston, the Institute for Professionalism and Ethical Practice. Uh, this is our website. And when I think about our mission statement, um, what we're focusing on are difficult conversations in healthcare, which I think are captured very well by this cartoon from the New Yorker, the physician saying, there's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to somebody who can. And you know, in years past, that may have been an okay thing to say to a patient, 
Um, I think increasingly that's not okay, and that confidence uh, in, in uh, the healthcare world really and now includes an ability to have conversations with patients. Um, our standard approach is uh, with short workshops where we'll, we'll pick a difficult conversation. And uh, for me, coming out of the pediatric ICU world, it started with talking with uh, families who had a, a child with a serious illness. And I think one of the things that stood out for me through, through all the years of doing pediatric ICU is that when families come back um, months or even years after they've had a child in the ICU, seriously ill, maybe didn't survive, I've always been struck that by how the, their memories of what went on medically can be very vague or, or even gone. But they will often have very vivid memories, even word-for-word -word memories, of something that was said to them at a particular moment in time. And sometimes those were just you know, words of great comfort. Somebody just came up with the, the, the right thing to say at the right moment. But sometimes those memories can be searingly painful when somebody said something that was very insensitive, uh, maybe not even realizing that they were saying it. And so um, it impressed on me how those conversations are really very, very important. Um, and need, need, we need to pay attention to those and make sure that we're handling those in the best possible way. Now, for many of the years that we did these workshops, um, I kind of thought that I was teaching communication skills. So I had my work with this group doing communication skills, and I had my work uh, in ethics, which seemed to me to be something quite different. But the more we explored this area, the more I began to think that what was really going on here in these conversations had a lot to do with ethics that I just wasn't appreciating. And so what I would like to discuss with you is the relationship, in a way, between how we think about ethics versus communication skills. Now, I've been teaching medical ethics uh, at Harvard Medical School now for almost 30 years. Uh, I think most of us share the belief that um, uh, we don't start by teaching ethical theory, but rather we emphasize a case-based teaching approach. And uh, a very popular uh, way of doing this is through kind of a, a Rawlsian reflective equilibrium, where we, we start with cases, and then we try to develop rules and principles out of that, relating those back to ethical theory, and you know, moving back and forth uh, across this spectrum, I think is a very popular way of teaching medical ethics. And I think it's a good way. But you know, if you think about how we teach, uh, even with this case-based approach, there tends to be a focus upon unusual or extreme situations. I mean, since you know, it's kind of commonplace that you should usually tell the truth, when we get into class, we talk about, well, it might be OK to lie to a patient, because it helps us to bring out some of those underlying principles. Or, of course, we normally get consent, but when can you treat a patient without consent? Um, you know, life and death type of things, of you know, pulling the plug, stopping tube feedings, they tend to be the kind of cases that we focus on, and I worry that our students come away thinking that the only time we really do ethics is when we're facing these unusual or extreme situations. Conversely, when we've taught communication skills, uh, we've been doing a number of good things, focusing on behavioral techniques, sitting down, making eye contact, that sort of thing, um, teaching mnemonics like the value mnemonic, or strategies like ask, tell, ask. I think that these could be uh, very useful. I'm not um, you know, saying we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, but it's, it, it tends to be the kind of formula that we follow. And I, I think in some sense it's gone a little bit too far in the use of scripts. So there are, uh, particularly in, in, uh, among nursing, there are some hospitals that are requiring nurses to go through you know, certain scripts, as is very common in the service industries. You know, when I get on the phone with Bank of America, I feel like I can't get off the phone until that guy has you know, gotten through his whole script. Um, and so a lot of this gets passed off as teaching communication skills. But as a medical student wrote in the New England Journal a few years ago, um, in medical school, we're taught to follow a script he wrote, but then the script ends. And just like that, I was in over my head. I had no script. 
only clinical judgment in a perplexing skill that can't be reviewed in morning rounds or diagrammed on PowerPoint slides. And so there needs to be more than this approach. And so I've been thinking about this concept, microethics. I didn't invent the word or anything like that, but it's a, it's a word that I think captures a way that we might link ethics and communication. And first of all, it depends on recognizing that most of the ethical decisions that we make in our careers are not dramatic. I call this the, the ethics of everyday practice, if you will. And furthermore, that most ethical choices, I think, are not recognized. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've sat down with particularly medical students who are just you know, sort of new to the field and describe a certain situation, and they, they look at me, and I'm waiting for them to, to say, oh my goodness, you know, what a difficult choice that would be. But oftentimes they don't. It's just sort of this blank look. They don't even see that there's an ethical issue on the table. And um, so I think one of the first things we need to do is to develop this moral imagination so that um, people can see the ethical choices that they're facing. It depends upon you know, looking at um, a situation through the eyes of the different stakeholders that are there. And understanding what are the ethical assumptions that they're bringing to the table, and how might we find common ground there. It's something that many of us who do ethics we sort of take for granted, but it's not a common skill, actually, and I think it needs to be cultivated. Another point here is that most ethical decisions are made in conversation. That's, that's how we go through our day, in the clinic or on the wards. It's in conversation with our colleagues, with patients and families, and that's where these ethical choices are being made. Um, and they're being, these uh, uh, decisions are shaped uh, moment by moment, word by word. So, you know, how you frame a question, um, the particular words that you might use, the way that you are going to present certain options to the patient, or, or not present them with certain options, or, you know, bring out certain questions, or make sure that certain questions don't come up for discussion. All of these are ethical choices that are being made moment by moment in these conversations. Um, I was particularly struck by some of the uh, things I read in this book from Rebecca Dresser, a, a well-known uh, bioethicist. And this was a book that uh, she edited or put together. These were essays from prominent bioethicists, all of whom have experienced cancer. So the book is Malignant Bioethicists Confront Cancer. So for example, here was a comment from Art Frank. Doctors and nurses make constant, small, ethical decisions in their everyday clinical work, like whether to take seriously a patient's complaints about treatment side effects. Their choices have a major impact on patients and caregivers. Concepts like beneficence and respect for persons are as relevant to these interactions as they are to conventional ethics concerns like decision-making about life-sustaining interventions. And so here's somebody very steeped in the bioethics tradition who's saying, there's more going on here. So Rebecca Dresser then writes, at times, work in our field conveys the impression that seriously ill patients and their families would be in good shape if clinicians would only do things like give patients the proper information, respect patients' choices, and follow advanced directives. We can assure you that this is not true. So there's something missing here. And what is it? What is it that's missing? What is it that we're not teaching? So I think it might be helpful to, to think about two different perspectives for doing bioethics. You might call these the macro and the micro perspective. So the macro perspective is the view from the outside. It's what we normally think about, I think, when we think about bioethics. It's, it's very analytic, it's theoretical, we appeal to theories, we do that you know, reflective uh, equilibrium process. One of the things we value a lot here is that our reasoning be generalizable so that similar cases are treated similarly. It's the, the standard way that we do things. Well, let's contrast this with what we might call the view from the inside, or microethics. Arising again, very commonly in conversations, it's arising spontaneously, so the conversations don't follow a linear logic. They tend to bounce around a lot. You're moving 
you know, in a chaotic way across many issues. They're relational in the sense that the decisions are literally being made in that relational space that we create when we sit down with somebody and have a conversation. It's coming out of that space in a very concrete sort of a way. And they're unique, obviously in the, in the sense that no two conversations will ever be exactly alike, but even more fundamentally, they're unique in that certain words said in one context and you know, working beautifully, very helpful words, in another context might not work at all. And so it's not about just coming up with the right words, it's coming up with the right words within a particular context. So when I think about um, the topic, um, the way that we've been examining it in our, our work at uh, Boston Children's is through conversations, as I've said. And we're using enacted conversations as a window to explore these microethical issues. And our, our standard format has been to have professional actors perform in the role of patients and family members with experienced practitioners engaging in these conversations as themselves. So doctors as doctors, nurses as nurses, etc. Um, these are spontaneous conversations. They're not scripted. Our actors are, are behaving in an improvisational way, saying whatever they would say as the conversation rolls out. And so in that way, it's an exploration of real life practice. Uh, in fact, oftentimes, uh, participants in a workshop like this will say it's even more real than real in the sense that First of all, it feels very real. I mean, I, I can vouch, you know, my pulse goes up, I get sweaty. But it's even more real than real, and then there's an opportunity afterwards to talk about what happened and to, to, to bring out a lot of the nuances that we don't normally have the opportunity to do when these conversations happen in real life. I'm going to show you a little video clip here in a moment of uh, one of these conversations. And one of the things I want to um, say before I show it to you is to emphasize that when we do these, we're not attempting to show best practice. It's not that we're saying, this is how it should be done. Uh, and I say that because, um, particularly when we're in the role of watching a little video clip like this, we tend to go into kind of a, a critical frame of mind of, you know, well, I wouldn't have said it that way, or I would never have brought that up. Um, and I would just offer to you uh, that I think that's not a, as helpful of a way to watch the clip as it could be rather than to see this as sort of a, a gift of getting to watch how somebody would do this in their actual practice. What can I learn from this clip? What might, you know, how might I change my own approach to these things? I find that to be a more productive way to, to watch them. I would encourage you to do so. The clip I'm going to show you comes out of a, uh, one of the projects we did on counseling women who are carrying a fetus with a congenital anomaly. And uh, uh, we did several, but the one I'm going to show you relates to a fetus with Down syndrome. And in this particular clip, uh, you'll see Valerie and Dan Larson. So again, they're represented by actors. Um, this is their second pregnancy. The first pregnancy ended with a miscarriage of 12 weeks. They declined first trimester screening. An ultrasound performed at 17 weeks shows a female fetus with the double bubble anomaly in the abdomen, which uh, your pediatricians will know signifies duodenal atresia and indicating an increased risk for Down syndrome. And so the purpose of the conversation you're going to watch is whether to follow up this ultrasound with amniocentesis, which would then make the diagnosis. Now, even though this is only, was only done maybe four years ago or so, uh, it's already out of date, and uh, uh, as many of you know, at this point, we would make that diagnosis with a non-invasive blood test. But when we did the filming, uh, that wasn't the case, and uh, an amniocentesis would be the next step. And so it's about whether um, Valerie Larson should have the amniocentesis. So it's about a six-minute clip, and um, I hope our sound and everything will, will work. Um, we went through a detailed targeted ultrasound of your daughter and there's one thing that does concern me that we need to talk about which is that
there is a little area in our abdomen where we see a stomach and right next to the stomach there's another little tiny black fluid collection. One of the things that we want to evaluate is why this has happened. And it can happen just because it happens. But it can be also associated with a chromosomal problem. And I know you chose not to have the screening early on, which is a totally fine choice. But I think this raises us to a next level where we have to at least discuss what the chances are that she might have Down syndrome based on this finding. Down syndrome. Down syndrome. Is there anything different we would do in the pregnancy if, if she had Down? Well, that's a decision that you guys have to decide. Certainly at 17 weeks, you have the option to not continue the pregnancy. And that is a very personal decision. We know. It's not um, a decision that can come by easily at all. And I think that that's a big step from right now. Right now, what we've noticed is a structural finding, one that is amenable to surgical correction, that does have an association with Down syndrome. And you, as her parents, have your first or one of your first big decisions about how much information you want and whether you're going to act on that information. The only way I can tell you yes or no is by actually getting the amniotic fluid and looking at it in the lab. Well, we want to know, right? I, mean, well, I, don't, I, I don't know. If, do we need to do that? I mean, do, and there's Just a risk for, from the there's a risk, yeah. thing, but you know, it's a very it small risk. <laughs> to know um, for many people exactly what decisions you would make until you know for sure that you're walking <coughs> in your shoes. Now if you were under the belief that under no circumstance would you interrupt the pregnancy, that is a one, you know, that's certainly a great method of um, going on with the pregnancy. Well, I just don't know how we're going to decide. I'm assuming we do the amniotest test and... How do other families decide this? <clears throat> it's a very, very personal <clears throat> choice and it's very difficult and it will take a lot of heart-wrenching conversations between the two of you, but there's no right and wrong choice. <clears throat> what would you do if you were us? I don't think I can really open, be honest with that per se. I would definitely have the amnio because I think that until you know whether she has Down syndrome or not Down syndrome, we're talking in a vacuum. I mean, I think you just don't know till you know. And I think that in my experience, miscarriage risk? The, even with the miscarriage risk, yeah, I do. I think the risk is quite low, um, but I think that my experience has been is that one never really knows what you will or won't do until you really know 100% that it affects you. And I've, I've been in this situation long enough to know that people have amnios thinking that they're going to opt out of a pregnancy if the results are positive and then choose not to. 
And I've had people who opted out of having the amnio give birth to a baby with Down syndrome and feel like, had they known, they would have not made that choice. So I think you don't know what you're going to do until you really find out all the information. Well, because also part of it is, I mean, if we do this test, then, then we have this decision. Whereas, you know, maybe we should not do it, and then just it's, you know, out of our hands. Like, if we, if we do the test, then we're, are we like, you know, we're playing God with, with this yeah. situation. Well, do you have a spiritual advisor or a church community? Not here, I know what Grandma Fuller would say. I mean, do we want to put ourselves in that position of having to make that choice? Because then it's just like, you know, how is that not going to rip us in half? Ironically, there is some thinking about it. Okay, call me if you need anything or any more information, okay? Okay. All right, so if we were in a seminar setting or a workshop setting, I would now ask you what stood out for you about that conversation. What moments uh, were there where you think ethical choices were being made? Um, we're not in a small enough group to do that. So I'll, uh, I'll suggest uh, some of the ethical moments that I think uh, did come up in that, in that conversation. Um, and Dr. Bromley, by the way, didn't tell you she's one of the um, uh, very prominent uh, maternal fetal medicine specialists in the Boston area. Um, uh, and you know, she, she'll have conversations like this uh, three or four times a week in her office, so this is very much what, what she does. Um, one of the ethical moments, I think, is uh, when Dr. Bromley said, information is always helpful. You don't know what you will really do until you have all of the information. And then, you know, Mr. Larson says, but if we do this test, then we have this decision. Whereas maybe we shouldn't do it. And then the decision is out of our hands. If we do the test, then we're playing God. Um, yeah, do we want to put ourselves in that position of having to make a choice? I mean, how is it? How is that not going to rip us in half? I have to tell you, I watched this video clip two or three times before, I mean, I, actually, I probably didn't even see it on my own. Somebody pointed it out to me, uh, this issue, because I'm the kind of a person where Information is always helpful. I mean, I can't imagine turning down an opportunity to get more information to make the decision. And so, you know, I, I watched her say that over and over, and it's like, that, that, that seems just absolutely uh, non-controversial to me. And then, you know, watching how that played out, I've had this insight into myself that um, that's a particular bias that I have, that information is always helpful. And that's not going to be true for everyone. And it's, it's a way that's really changed my own practice, is, is to recognize that, that tendency, that bias that I have. Um, then the question, of course, what would you do if you were in our position? How many of you in the clinical world have ever had anybody ask that question? What would you do? I mean, I think it's a, it's a very common one. It's a tough situation. Um, and Dr. Bromley starts off by saying, I don't think that I can really be open be honest with that, per se. But then the very next thing she says, I would definitely have to get. <laughs> uh, even with the miscarriage risk, oh yes, even with the miscarriage risk, the risk is quite low, right? Okay. Um, see the ambivalence and how, how we're responding to that ethical moment. And then the question of termination. Of course, she says what we're all taught to say, there's no right or wrong answer. But many people in our society actually do believe there are right and wrong answers to this. How do we hold those biases when we're having these conversations? Um, there were many issues with framing, and, and the, we did a whole bunch of videotapes with different uh, specialists. And we heard lots of different words, uh, termination versus abortion versus morselation. Um, you know, are you talking about the baby or the fetus? Do you refer to the mother or the woman? Do we talk about somebody with Down syndrome as being disabled, <coughs> other able, handicapped, challenged? In fact, one of our pediatricians pointed out, why are we even talking about this as delivering bad news? Because right away, you're framing this in a certain way. Why is this necessarily bad news? 
the baby has Down syndrome. Right off, or, you know, you're, 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 you're definitely biasing how this is going to be perceived. Um, we saw physicians and, and, uh, and nurses and social workers move back and forth depending on how they thought the conversation was going. And they see the conversation going one way, you start to talk about the fetus, going the other way, you start to talk about the baby. These are all, I think, important ethical choices that we're making in these conversations. Um, so, you know, back to these two views. I mean, I think that they're both very valid. I think the outside view, when we talk about the abortion question, this is, you know, how I, we, we talk about it when I teach my medical students uh, in our class. Um, you know, we read uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson's paper about a woman waking up in bed with a, a, a unconscious violinist attached to her body and needs to stay attached for the next nine months in order to survive. And we, we talk about that paper and question what is the moral status of a fetus? Does a fetus have independent rights? What are the ethical obligations or duties of a woman, that is, for a mother to a fetus or an unborn baby? What will lead to the best outcomes, uh, all things considered? What are the best policies for preserving the moral fabric of our communities and our society? I think these are all really good questions, and it's one way to talk about the issue. The inside view tends to, I think, be a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I, I tell my medical students, I say, you know, there's going to be a time when you're going to be sitting face to face with a woman uh, talking about this issue. And uh, talking about an unconscious violinist is probably not the right way to approach the conversation in that moment. So how are you going to do it? Um, and it's, I think it has to do a lot with resolving, sometimes revising ethical views in light of current reality, examining the implications of an ethical decision, maintaining one's personal integrity. How are you going to look at yourself and this decision several years down the line? What's the impact on the other relationships in your life? What about other practical issues in your life? School, job, et cetera. Uh, what will make this a good decision? And there's, you know, the, the mix here is different. Rel relative importance of data, opinions of family and friends, faith commitments, et cetera. So I think you're getting the idea here of, of, of these two different ways of talking about ethics. Um, in finishing up, I'm going to uh, just rather briefly mention three themes that I think uh, often come up uh, on this micro-ethical level. Um, they are the, the ethics of respecting and constructing patient values and preferences, the ethics of self-awareness, self-disclosure, and management of physicians' values and biases, and the ethics of managing medical information. So let's talk a little bit about, about the first one, uh, respecting and constructing patient values and preferences. So, you know, let's reflect for a moment about how patients and families like the Larsons make decisions. And there's a standard model that we tend to teach, which is that the doctors provide the medical option, the patients provide the values, and out of this, a decision is made. It's almost, you know, sort of a meat grinder example. The, you, you put in the scientific facts from the medical professionals, you, you put in the values from the patients, and then you give it a crank, and out comes this decision. But as uh, Carl Schneider has written, this task is hardly as simple as the schematic formulation makes it sound. Those values raise the most imponderable <coughs> questions human beings ask, because they are so hard to face, to formulate, and employ. Those values are usually unexplored and undeveloped. In short, patients will often lack what autonomous too readily assume, a set of preferences which are clearly defined, well understood, and rank ordered. And so there's a literature now around the ethics of not just eliciting patient preferences, which I think is what we've all been taught, but recognizing that those um, preferences and values are often inchoate to help patients construct their preferences. Now, what are the ethical issues there? Well, certainly, we want to say that we're authentically constructing these preferences from core values. But recognizing also that we have enormous power over how that happens. Um, and I you know, could go on and on. I'm just going to mention a couple of things here. Cognitive framing, the word choice again, the words that we choose to use, the tone of our voice. People listening to us can tell just from the tone what, what one you think would be the best one. You know, you sort of 
either that's the first one you present, or you kind of present it in the middle of a road choice, and most people do, that sort of a thing. Use of statistics, an, an obvious one, but, but nevertheless worth saying, you know, to, to say that um, uh, there's about a third of our patients who die from this procedure. We're saying most of the time this procedure works. Could be absolutely equivalent ways of describing it, but has a very different impact on the patient and how they think about the choice. And then non-cognitive factors. Um, uh, struck by the work of Antonio Damasio on, on uh, emotions and, and how people make decisions. And you know, increasingly I think we're recognizing that, especially around hard choices, we think not in ideas and words, but in images. Even so far as vision, smells, emotions, memories from our past that really play a powerful role and often, most often, don't actually come up and be and are acknowledged. So is there a role for beneficent persuasion? Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the work of Cass Sunstein and, and others around this idea of nudging people to make choices that are good for them. And uh, this is uh, written about as libertarian paternalism, um, helping us to make more rational behavior. You know, So some of it's pretty straightforward. You walk into a cafeteria, Healthy foods are at eye level, easy to get. The sodas are around the back and you have to reach down to get them, those sorts of things. But there's a lot of uh, applications in, in healthcare as well. So, you know, um, some of it is helping the patient to uh, appeal to their higher preferences. And I think most of us would say it's relatively non controversial for a, a clinician to say, I know you enjoy smoking, but I uh, also know that you will be happier if you quit. Okay, that's something that physicians do. But what about this one? I know you are frightened about the prospect of having a child with Down syndrome, but most couples who continue the pregnancy end up saying they were happy they did. And many who choose to terminate often report feeling guilty about it. Now where does that fit? Is that an appropriate nudge or where does it, where does it cross the line? One, uh, one example of this from my own specialty, intensive care, I found to be uh, particularly striking. So this was a, a study done a couple of years ago of intensive care uh, physicians talking with families about um, uh, whether or not to terminate life support. And these physicians described how they highlight suffering, the concept of suffering, with people I think we should withdraw support on. But I would never use that approach on people I think we should press ahead on. Right? So the idea of a sort of differential use of the word suffering in order to move families in the direction that we think is the choice that is right for them and the patient. And when questioned about this, these physicians actually denied that this was persuasion. They simply described this as an act of informing. So I think there's a lot of ethics that's going on in these conversations around how we're helping patients construct preferences. Second is the ethics of self-awareness, self-disclosure, and management of values and biases. Let me start with um, what I think is, in, in some sense, uh, a, a non-controversial uh, point in how we teach people to counsel, particularly in genetics, the idea that counseling should be non-directive. Let me push back a, a little bit on that. Um, so non-directive counseling is, is generally regarded as the preferred approach. But think about this from a couple of different perspectives. Is non-directive counseling even possible? Many of our biases are unconscious. We aren't even aware that we have them, as, as I described around, you know, information is always good. So you, you obviously can't be neutral around the things that you're not even aware of. Um, but even more so, is there any such thing as a non-biased position, or as Tom Nagel wrote about the, uh, the view from nowhere? Does a non-biased position even exist? And then, whether or not it's possible, is non-directive counseling to be preferred? Should our biases uh, be expressed or repressed? What would help patients and families more? To sit down with somebody who says, you know, let me tell you, I have certain views about what you're facing. Here they are, now let's talk about them. And then afterwards, I'd like you to go meet with somebody, if you'd like, who doesn't share my biases, my, my assumptions. Would families be better served by that or by somebody who's trying the best they can to hide their biases? recognizing that, you know, in all cases, they may not be successful with that. 
I've been fascinated over the years by this question, you know, doctor or nurse or social worker, if this were your child, what would you do? I first wrote about it um, a number of years ago in pediatrics. Um, and this, of course, is one of the questions that came up in the, in the little video you saw. We've actually done some research around this uh, using a number of videos. We picked out um, areas where our actor patient family said, you know, doctor, what would you do if, if, you, were, if you were in our shoes? And uh, we, we studied the responses. Some of them were, um, you know, it, it revealed that this is a very difficult con uh, question for us to, to deal with. Uh, one person said, I think you're asking me one of the, his voice cracked, hardest things that anyone could ever ask. Someone else said, I think what I would do to come to a decision is to really, really work with, you know, my husband and my, my parents and my church and pray and hope it would come to me. And we just really struggle with that. Over the years, I, I've come to sort of categorize responses into, into three different groups here. Um, so one way of responding, and I think that Dr. Bromley showed all three of these, by the way, would be that personal values should be concealed. As in, to be honest, my opinion about this is irrelevant. This, this is your decision. Okay, and so Dr. Bromley said that when, in the beginning, she says, I can't, I can't be open. I can't be honest with you. I can't share my, my feelings with you. Another is to say that our views should be shared but qualified as personal, as in, I would tend to think about your situation as follows, but this is purely my personal opinion. Um, and Dr. Bromley showed that one too, when she says, I would have the amnion. And then maybe a third way of responding is to offer our views as potentially helpful and instructive, as in, I've seen lots of patients in this situation, and based on my experience, I think it would be best if you did such and such. And we saw Dr. Bromley use this approach as well, when she says, I've seen people who chose to have the amnio and were glad they did, those who didn't have the amnio and regretted it later. You know, this is out of my clinical experience. Um, I think, you know, one of, the big, one of the big things that I think people get from thinking about this question now is that it's, it's, it's a complex question. And it's not okay to simply just answer, well, here's what I would do. There's many layers here. How one responds, I don't think there's any right or wrong ways. I think that we can be very self-disclosing at times and not others. It's going to depend on the context. It's going to depend on the situation. Okay, finally, um, the ethics of managing medical information. What are the ethical norms for managing information? Well, you know, when we teach in the medical school, we teach that patients have a right to all information that is materially relevant to their decision. So then the question is, is it ethical to actually question that and dispense information like medication, that is, dosing it to the patient's needs? Here I'll refer to uh, the work of Ron Epstein and others around thinking about how do we dose information. Uh, should we tell a patient about a benign liver cyst that's seen on a CT scan that's done for a suspicious lung nodule? So how do we manage incidental findings for should we tell a patient with a panic disorder about a borderline long QT interval and its risk for cardiac arrest? I think the, the, the questions are more complex than just, you know, dumping information. We really need to take this into account and, and think about situations where dosing is the way to go. One of the um, things that I've really struggled with over the years, I, I uh, am trained in anesthesiology as well. I don't, I don't do anesthesia anymore, but I did for many years. And I always struggled with whether I had to say the word death as part of getting consent for anesthesia. Um, you know, in pediatrics, you know, you got parents come in with their lovely little three-year-old child who's about to have his tonsils out. And, you know, they've already made the decision they're going to have the operation. They're not going to leave. And I need to get the signature on the bottom of the anesthesia consent form. But do I say that word death? And, um, you know, in watching my colleagues over the years, I know that there's some that do it all the time. There's some that never do it. Um, we've never, in all the years that I, I was an anesthesiologist, we never really talked about it. And I think it's a pretty important ethical decision that we have to make. Um, and, you know, if you're going to do it sometimes and not others, then what are the factors that play a role in how you make that decision? 
Nocebo effects, I think, are fascinating. So you know, placebo effects are when something you say, let's say, uh, makes the patient feel better. Nocebo effects are when something you say makes the patient feel worse. Should certain types of information be withheld to prevent nocebo effects? I'm sure that some of you are familiar with this study, but I think it's fascinating. So in a study involving uh, treatment of men with benign prostatic hypertrophy, who were going to be treated with this drug finasteride, they, they did a randomized trial, and they found that omitting the information that it may cause erectile dysfunction, decreased libido, problems with ejaculation, but these are uncommon, reduced the rate at which these side effects were actually reported from 44% to 15%. So it's an interesting question. I mean, could we be justified in sometimes not giving information, which some people would say you have to give because it's materially relevant, but when you give it, you know you're actually going to be provoking uh, the side effects that you hope won't happen. So just in conclusion, uh, let me just say, what does make a medical decision ethical? And suggest here that a good decision is one that emerges from, or perhaps is constructed during, the conversation that reflects preferences that have been authentically constructed for the patient's core values, seeks transparency with regard to preferences and values of the physician, and is shaped by information that's been titrated to the needs of the patient. So with that, I'll stop, and uh, I hope we'll have some, some conversation about it.
situation and their family and that there has just been a divorce or there's just been a, the death in the family and all those personal things that really go into trying to figure out how to start the conversation, how when to stop the conversation, continue. Because increasingly, you may be getting this bad news from somebody you've never met before. Yeah. And so how do we take that into consideration in this model? Um, it's a terrific point. Uh, I think, you know, and, and of, of course, our knowledge of patients are all, is always incomplete, even when there's some, a patient that we think we know fairly well. And we're at risk of making a, a big mistake here, right? I guess I would just say we're at risk of making a big mistake either way. I mean, I think we can't avoid the risks. Um, I, I think that the notion of, of, you know, sort of all relevant information is always a good place to start. And we should, we should, we should move away from that with trepidation because as soon as you start to move away and start to tailor the information beyond what we would all generally agree is relevant information, you're, some, you're moving into perilous territory. On the other hand, there's going to be times where I think that's the right thing to do, and times where you're making a mistake. Um, and I guess I would say finally, I think we do it all the time. We're always playing with that boundary. I would just like to make it more conscious, more explicit, and, and have us be thinking about what we're doing when we do it. So, Bob. Um teaching that I do in medical school and residency is just not all that helpful for the people that I'm teaching. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I love moral theory. I, mean, I, don't, it, uh, I love it. Uh, I love to think about it. I love to think about problems in that way. And I think that our students should have some capacity in it. On the other hand, so many, you know, we see it all the time. We see, we see people who really cannot engage a patient or a family and help them work through a problem and come to a good answer. And I, I, I think it's, it's like that cartoon at the very beginning. I think that's unconscionable. And so, first of all, I think that we should recognize that this is an ethical issue. And then secondly, I think it would modify the way that we do our training to focus more on um, strategies for problem solving in the real world rather than abstract theoretical approaches to problems. Fascinating talk. I have a question about the last uh, J by information. And the question is what's the scope of all relevant information? One, one of the things that was striking is there was a lot of relevant information about amphysemesis and the medical issues. And no discussion whatsoever about what it's like to have a Down syndrome trial. And there was a recommendation to consult with spiritual counselor, something like that, but not with parents of children with Down syndrome, or you can imagine many kinds of consultations. So, but that raises questions about the kind of what the role, uh, a clinical role in what kind and social and cultural information right. uh, is included in the discussion. I would just say that's a, a wonderful <coughs> point, and I think it, it we'll be getting back to the, 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 the last comment. Um, we, we tend to talk about you know material materially relevant information as if we all know what it is. <laughs> you know, I sort of well, I'm going to tell them everything that's materially relevant, recognizing as, as you're pointing out that it, it, in fact there's huge choices that are being made of what to cut out of that and what to focus on, and. Uh, Again, it would just it would just be that moral imagination of seeing that as an issue that is something that we ought to be talking about, and we'll never be perfect at it. But at least we can't get better if we don't talk about it. Hi. The last portion of your talk about the ethics of presenting medical information. Um, how do you approach that situation where maybe parents want to withhold information from a child, particularly? Yeah, I mean, 
mean, um, so of course, you know, in the, in the pediatric world, that's something that we deal with a lot, whether it's a, a cancer diagnosis or an HIV diagnosis, those sorts of things. Um, all I would say is, uh, I don't think there's any rules about that, you know. Um, I just had one of our uh, master's degree students write an essay uh, about um, that we just simply need to recognize that you said you're an adult when you're 18, and you know, up until the day you turn 18, we're going to treat you like a child, and, and you know, and after that we're going to treat you like an adult, and uh, I, mean, I, I spent quite a bit of time responding to that essay because I think that of course that's, that's silly. And all of this is going to depend on really spending time and figuring out what's the right way to handle it. And there's, there's no rules.
think, well, like that, I mean, I think that's an incredible question, and it's really kind of what the whole talk was about. I, I um, um, you know, remind, it reminds me of a, a pediatric oncologist that I knew who had a child with cancer who always struggled with when was it the right moment to say to a family, you know, I've been through this too. I had a child with cancer. She tells me that she's done it a handful of times. How did she know that it was the right thing to say in that moment as opposed to way too much self-disclosure? Um, you know, I, a lot of people would say you should never do that. You know, they have a rule about that sort of thing. I just don't think that those rules work. Um, on the other hand, you know, we're playing with fire here. This is really powerful stuff. And the, the decision of when to, when to self-divulge in that way is, is really, really important. So I guess I would, I would just say, you know, it's time. <laughs> Thank you.